Hi, my name is Dr. Janelle Ott. I teach double reads at Angelo State University and applied bassoon at McMurray and Abilene Christian Universities in Abilene. This is a video I'm making to show you how I form my reads. It's intended for my college students, but anybody who needs a refresher on how to form a blank or who just wants to see how I do it, this is your chance. So let's start out with the things we need. Um, first of all, you need soaked, gouge shaped and profiled cane. So this is cane that I started soaking last night. I like to do at least an eight hour soak on my cane. The main thing that I've gotten from the longer soak, I used to only do the three hour soak for this step, but I found since I started soaking the cane longer, I get far fewer cracks that go into the blade of the wreath. Um, okay, so we have the cane that's been soaked. This is 22 gauge brass wire. Now you do need to get the wire from a double reed supplier. I've never seen it just for sale on the shelves of a store anywhere. One thing I have been noticing lately is that the 22 gauge brass wire that my students are coming to lessons with is thicker for some reason than my 22 gauge brass wire. Um, if it's thicker, it's much harder to use. I don't have a solution. I, it's just something I want you to be aware of. So this 22 gauge brass wire I picked up at a TMEA convention, Texas Music Educators Association, a couple of years ago, it was before lockdown. And I think I got it from River City Reads, but I don't think I could swear to that in court. Um, anyway, just be aware that even if it says 22 gauge brass wire, it may not be exactly what you think. We have cotton string. This is cotton string or cooking twine. It's the same kind of thing that you would use to tie up a roast that you're cooking. Or if you ever tie, if you ever roast a chicken and you tie the, the legs of the chicken together, this is what you use for that. You can find it in just about any hardware store and just about any grocery store. If you go to the aisle that has like the pans and the serving spoons and the kitchen supplies, there will usually be um, a cone or a ball of cooking twine that you can buy. We also have an easel. So this is an easel. Uh, it's just a four inch piece of one inch diameter dowel. You could get this made for you pretty easily at a hardware store, or you can buy it from a double reed supplier. Uh, pliers. I actually prefer the kind of pliers that you would get from a hardware store or an auto supply store. Uh, the reason is because um, I want pliers that have really good wire cutters in the back, and I found that sometimes the specialty pliers you get from double reed suppliers don't have very good wire cutters. I also like something that's just a little bit heavier because it gives me a little bit better torque when I'm working with wires. It means I just don't need to work quite as hard to get the same result physically. Um, other than that, we have a mandrel. So I really like to use this mandrel. This is a Chris Lieb mandrel. I think it is um, advertised on Chris Lieb's products as like a pin vise mandrel and what's nice about it is that you can take the mandrel tip out and replace it with other mandrel tips so this is my regular mandrel tip that I use when I'm scraping reeds but for this part of the process I'm going to replace it with this forming pin so this is a stainless steel Chris Lee products forming pin they also sell brass forming pins and in the beginning I used almost all brass forming pins because they are cheaper but I have found that the stainless steel forming pins heat much more quickly and much more consistently so I would recommend stainless steel if there is any way that you can possibly afford stainless steel use stainless steel we also have an exacto blade you could also use a straight razor for this step um, a pencil I like to use a heated mandrel, so this is my alcohol lamp. I got it from a science supply provider, I believe. Um, so in addition to having the cotton wick, 
we have denatured alcohol as the fuel. Uh, denatured alcohol is something that you can find pretty easily. It is usually in the paint section of any store that sells paint. So for example, the bottle of denatured alcohol that I currently have, I got from Walmart. Uh, be careful where you store your alcohol lamps. It's usually pretty stable, but I shy away from keeping it in a hot car or right next to a heater. Um, I've never had anything explode on me, uh, but just use a little common sense. And also be careful in how you dispose of the empty tin of denatured alcohol. Cigarette lighter. And last but not least, a tin. So I actually recommend using Altoids tins, but I often don't have one because they tend to walk away and end up in my students' backpacks because they need one. So <laughs> I'm going to use this DuckTales pastel tin instead. Um, Altoids is better. This is just, I use this because I'm never going to give it away. This is never going into my students' backpack. Uh, it's not a perfect vessel, but it is a box that is made out of metal, and that's kind of what we need. Okay, so we're going to get started. We take our piece of GSP, and we're going to place it on the easel. If you don't have an easel, you can lay it down flat on any surface. Just make sure that there is some cardboard or paper or something underneath it, because we're going to score the cane. Score just means that we're going to put some um, controlled lines cut controlled lines into the cane so that we can help it crack more evenly. So you're going to take your X-Acto blade or whatever. I like to start scoring about halfway up the, the uh, tube and you're going to just pull down the X-Acto blade. So what you have is a cut that does not go very far into the cane. It's okay if it goes all the way in, but it doesn't need to. It's really just scratching the surface. And it's actually even kind of hard for you to see, and that's all right. You want to do kind of straight, try to make it straight, and you want as many of these lines as you can get. The more lines you have on this part of the cane, the more evenly it's going to crack. So I tell my students to shoot for it at least five to seven lines, but more is better. And if they're not perfect, that's okay. So we do the other side. Okay, next step, we're going to take a wire. So I like to cut my wire about an inch and a half to two inches long. It's probably two inches long. I'd rather have it too long instead of too short. And we're going to put it inside the tin. Notice I've cut a whole bunch of wire because I'm going to be making reads after this video is over. Um, this is a step that I don't see a lot of people doing, but I find it really does help. So I'm going to shake the wires in this metal box for about 30 seconds pretty hard. And what that's going to do is it's going to kind of soften the wire. It's going to get some of the kinks out of the wire. And I have found, believe it or not, that the wire is less likely to break when you do this step first. So here you go. So we're going to take a wire, one wire per read, and we're going to fold this read over. Now, when I profiled the cane, I already had it folded over before I let it dry. So I don't need to remeasure anything at this point. I just fold it over. If you don't do that ahead of time, you'll have to line up the read with a knife blade 
and fold it over the knife blade so it stays straight, but I find this works a lot better. Okay, so holding the blades together with your fingers, we're going to put one wire on, and I like to put it about where the first wire is going to go, so pretty close to the to the collar. So notice I'm holding the wire with my index finger that is underneath the reed, then I'm going to fold one arm over, fold the other arm to the other side, turn the reed around, grab the sides, and continue to fold one side over the other. Now we have an X, and what's really important to understand is we have one wire that is the top wire, that's this wire right now, and we have one wire that's the bottom wire, that's this wire right here. If you start twisting in the wrong direction, so that would be going this way, so the top wire is going backwards, what's going to happen is the top wire is going to get pushed to the bottom instead of staying on the top. And that messes up the tension that's being applied by the wires, so we want to avoid it. So make sure you twist the wire in such a way that the top wire stays on top of the loop that you've made. Um, now I'm doing this step partly with my fingers and partly with my pliers. Um, I'm just lining up both sides of the reed so that I'm trying to avoid the blade slipping later on. If you want to use your pliers, here's how you do it. You grab at the base of the knot you pull out just a little bit and then you twist. So grab the base, pull, twist. That's going to ensure that you have a knot that is pulling evenly on both sides of the reed. Now at this stage, we don't need the wire to be super tight. In fact, if you look, you can see there's a little bit of slack that I've left on the, on the reed and that's okay. Uh, the main purpose of the wire at this point in time is going to just be to reinforce the shape of the reed. We're not going for a finished reed. We're just getting it into the basic shape we want it to be before we tie it. So lining up the edges, making sure they're as symmetrical as possible. We take some cotton thread. So at this point, uh, I like to soak the cotton thread before I use it. The reason we are using cotton thread is because when you get cotton wet, it will become stretchy. There will be some give in the thread. And we want something that's going to stretch a little bit. We're going to use the cotton to reinforce the round shape of the reed as we try to turn this basically flat piece of cane into something that is circular. So. I'm gonna form my reeds after this is over, so I'm gonna just throw the next piece of cotton string in the water with the reeds so it's ready to go when I need it. And now we're going to wrap the reed in the cotton thread. So the first layer of cotton, you want it to be fairly symmetrical. So I'm starting just above the collar. I'm not applying very much force at all. I'm not pulling. Uh, we're just using this to reinforce, but I am trying to make sure that the wrap is fairly even. So we have not a lot of space between the loops and all the loops are lined up right next to each other, like so. Now, I like to use a lot of thread. Like I said, I'd rather have too much than not enough. So I always have more than one layer of thread. And once we get past the second one, we can start to get a little bit less precise with what we're doing. So I sort of semi-fasten it by just wrapping it around this wire a couple of times. At this point, the, the reed has been wrapped so many times that if this top layer comes undone, if the, if the wire or if the thread starts to unwind, it's okay. All right, so at this point, if I'm doing a whole bunch of reeds, I'll do up to this stage and then I'll put all the reeds back in the water to hang out until I'm ready for them. The next step is that we're going to light our alcohol lamp. So 
like so. I'm, what you want, and this isn't the best camera angle, but I think you can still see it. You want a flame, actually, so there's supposed to be a little wick knob here that I use to move the wick up and down, but guess what? I don't know where it is, so I use the much less scientific method of just pulling the wick out a little bit. Um, how much wick is coming out of the alcohol lamp will determine the size and shape of your flame. So I've got a little bit more than I actually want, but we're gonna, we're gonna live with it. You want a flame that has some blue in it. Uh, the blue is the hottest part of the flame and that's where we're going to heat the mandrel. So sticking the mandrel pretty close to the top of the wick, I like to heat the mandrel in either two or three sections. So I'll do it here, two, three. Then I'll flip to the other side and I'll do the same thing. One, two, three. So, and when I'm heating it, I try to do about between 10 and 20 seconds. If you're using a brass pin, you have to do at least 30 seconds. And I'll usually do a third quadrant for the brass one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Move it up. One two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. The counting is a good idea because you want to make sure that the reed is being, or the mandrel is being heated evenly. Once you make two or three hundred reads, you'll start to develop a sense for how long you actually need to let the mandrel sit. So I'm not being super, super strict about counting at this point because I'm talking to you, but I would recommend you keep a count either silently or out loud, especially if you're new to blank forming. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty in the last quadrant. And um, at this point I start looking at the read I'm going to take and Sometimes if I'm feeling fancy, I'll try to pick it up with one hand. I'm not going to do that today. It's not really the best plan. So I think you can see the tip of my mandrel starting to glow just a little bit. That's okay. It doesn't scare me. It's fine. The reed's not going to catch on fire. It might get scorched. I, do, I haven't found any evidence that scorching the inside of the reed changes the way it plays in a good way or a bad way, I don't think it actually matters. The reason for using the heated mandrel is the heat is going to help the reed change its shape very quickly. Um, all right, so we pick up the reed and we're going to grab the reed at the base with the pliers, like so. So I like to do the reed in my right hand mandrel in my left hand. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply just a little bit of pressure to the reed, to the sides of the reed, so it opens up a little bit more. And then we insert the mandrel into the hole. Once the reed is on the mandrel, I switch to fingers and I push it down the mandrel. And 
it actually did a really beautiful job forming right now. It's almost exactly flush with the mandrel pin and that's what we want. If that's not what happens, <laughs> then I'll take my pliers and I'll smush just the very bottom of the reed going all the way around to get it to be a little bit more circular and then I'll push a little bit more. So pushing the reed onto the mandrel is something that takes some practice. It's a little hard to describe exactly how hard you need to push and exactly how far and all of this thing. So just observe what works and what doesn't work. Pay a special attention to if something works. We tend to focus a lot on what doesn't work and the mistakes we make. If something goes really well, try to figure out what you did and try to replicate that. So uh, that is how you form a reed. At this point, you can put it on a drying rack or you can put it just on the tabletop. Try to keep it someplace safe where animals are not going to get to it. Uh, I have cats that really like to eat my reeds and I will keep them out of the room while we're doing this step. Once the reeds have dried, you can put them someplace else. So I've got a large number of formed blanks that I need to tie today. I've just been keeping them in a box that has a lid. Um, depending on how good your pencil is, you can put the date on the reed now. Oh, today is I think the ninth. The pencil will show up a lot better if you wait until the reed dries, but sometimes I forget to do it if I don't do it right away. Uh, you can also put the reed in a drying rack. Uh, the reed does tend to dry a little bit faster on a drying rack. It's nice to see how many reeds are standing up. I have a drying rack. It's just not in the office with me right now. So that is the entire process of forming a reed. I hadn't planned to do a second one, but I will just so you can see me do one more. So this is what it looks like when I do it without all of the commentary. So hopefully it'll be a little bit faster. So first we score. Add the wire. Check the sides, make sure they're symmetrical. Bring out the thread. Notice I'm leaving a little bit of space at the bottom of the reed that's not covered in thread. That's because if you don't do that, the thread's going to fall off the bottom of the reed when you form it. And that makes it really hard to see if the reed has formed well to the mandrel or if you need to keep pushing. So leave a little bit of space at the bottom. One thing I forgot to mention, uh, the reason I put the date on the blanks when they've been formed is I want to keep track of how long they've been forming. I like to let them sit about two weeks before I wrap them, if at all possible. Sometimes we don't have time to wait two weeks and we wrap them, at least wait until the reed has dried. Uh, is it possible to completely finish a reed in one sitting? What do I even mean by that? What I mean is, is it possible to profile, well, yeah, to gouge, shape, profile, form, and tie a reed all in one sitting. 
You can't because we need to let the cane dry between certain steps. In theory, if you soak your cane before you gouge it, you could go straight from the gouger to the shaper, straight from the shaper to the profiler, straight from the profiler to the forming, and then you could go far enough that you're putting all of the wires on the reed after you've formed it. I think that it's better to take time between steps on a bassoon reed. I find that that makes bassoon reeds that are more stable. You also tend to do better work because the entire process of making a bassoon reed is probably about 700 steps. And we are humans, and there are only so many things we can pay attention to all the time. So breaking it up helps you do more consistent work. It's also a little bit less traumatic for the cane. We are asking the cane to become very different from its natural state. So I found that letting the reed rest and soaking the reed multiple times before you actually play it that all makes the reed much more consistent. Um, if you really had to, there's a universe that exists where you could do 75% of the reed making process in one day. But you can't actually tie a wet reed because the duco that you're using or the hot glue, that needs to go on a dry surface. It's not, it's going to get really gummy and weird if you put it on cane that is still wet. Okay. Take the reed, grab it by the butt. Okay, so this one's not forming as well, that's okay. I'm not going to panic. I'm just going to give it a little suggestion of what it should be doing. That's better. Yeah, the, the corners are being a little stubborn on this one. But notice everything that I do makes the thread fall off a little bit. So that's why you don't wrap it all the way to the bottom. That wasn't a good idea. Okay, eight, nine. Okay. See, just from making those two reeds, the mandrel has started to heat up. So that's how you form a blank.